I want to start with a passage of scripture uh, out of uh, 1 Timothy 4. And Paul writes to Timothy, and to put this in context, he's just provided Timothy for the groundwork or the or should I say the the foundation to appoint an episcopos or or a bishop. And so he's setting up this and I, I will say it's a new organization to the church. But I believe that one of the things that were, would drive this is that this organization fit well in the Gentile church, where it wouldn't fit as well in the church of the Jews. So, but uh, just reading from uh, chapter 4, <clears throat> but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, this doesn't mean end times, latter times, later than this time, in later hours, in later days, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate, advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. And he continues, he says, in pointing out these things, talking to the above, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of sound doctrine which you have been following, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit. Whoa. He, he says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And I'll stop there. When, as we continue in the quarter, we will, we will be reminded of this passage. Because it's a, it, it, in a sense, it's a prophetic utterance of Paul. Times in the future that there will be men who will fall away from the faith, paying attention to de de deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate from abstaining from foods. Now, and Paul talks about abstaining from foods. He's talking about the same thing that happened at the Council of Jerusalem. Because, and I'll tell you why, the, the foods of the restauranteurs, of those who, who had the inns, guess where would they, they would buy those foods? From the temple. From the temple. And, and that was just a common practice. That was where the foodstuffs went. That was part of the economy of Rome. So, so they were sacrificed to idols. Anytime you went into a public place and you, and you grabbed the shish kebab off the rack and, and ate it, you were probably eating something sacrificed to an idol. And Paul said, what's an idol? So he says, for conscience sake, don't ask. <laughs> For conscience sake, don't ask. And, and so, I, that was an issue. That became an issue immediately. 
That was an issue that was, that was there right then. Now, the other issue, which uh, men who, who advocated abstaining from marriage, that doesn't come uh, forward in, in, for a, a few generations yet. Uh, it, it, there are probably some who are practicing celibacy, but it, it, it's in a different light, and it's not impositional celibacy. That later you see this impositional celib- celibacy uh, arise, and and Paul said, "Hey, beware of these guys. Take note of these guys because they are seared in their conscience." And, and we will take note of that. Uh, one of our heroes, one of our, our church heroes is one of these guys. And, 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 and you'll, uh, you'll, you'll start to appreciate what Paul had written here. Now, the other part of that, and I want to... Uh, I want to uh, I want to read... Uh, a passage um, out of uh, Pelican. And I, and I will emphasize this. I will emphasize this continually. Uh, on page 68 he says, History is usually dictated by the victors. As the principal sources of information about the development of Christian doctrine are the writings of Orthodox theologians. So most of of what has been known about these uh, heresies, at least until the 20th century, has come from the works of those who combated them. Okay? Now, he, he makes the point. He says, The presupposition of those works was that the primitive deposit of Christian truth had been given by Christ to the apostles and by them in turn to the succession of orthodox bishops and teachers while the heretics were those who forsook this succession and departed from this deposit. Now, if we really stretch out, we see what the Catholic Church says about Martin Luther. He was not apostolic succession. None of, the, of those who came out of the German movement were. And so, so you have that as, as, as something that is, should I say, cast in stone or it in its, in its entirety becomes orthodox in itself. That the, that the organization then becomes orthodox. And so automatically that puts somebody like Martin Luther out of orthodoxy. It makes him a heretic. Now, as we, as we read on, you'll see, heretics said origin. All begin by believing and afterwards depart from the road of faith and the truth of the church's teaching with only a few latitudinary, uh, latitudinarian exceptions both the heretics and the orthodox although it is misleading to use such terms as though they were some method of determining a priori who were the villains and who were the heroes were agreed throughout the controversies from 100 to 600 that there was only one true doctrine and each party claimed that each party claimed to possess now so that is something that that we really must take into account remember that the history is written by the victors and and so many times by counsel or by church bishopric somebody declared to be a heretic is only trying to explain something that is being developed and they don't like his explanation and I think that uh, I think that one such person uh, and and we'll look uh, we'll look at him when we get there uh, Sibelius and modalism 
I think he was, I think he was misaligned. I think that, that he was, for political purposes, was deemed the enemy. Because he, he explained the triunity in a different sort of fashion than the Trinitarians were presenting. But it was, I believe, that his, some of his uh, explanations were, I believe, to be understood. I believe that, that he had a, a, a very nice way of explaining something that is very mysterious indeed. <clears throat> and the church calls him a heretic. And so if, for, for instance, if you believe what Sibelius said, then you are a heretic, right? Now, when I, when I describe myself, I don't describe myself as Lutheran or Baptist or, or Presbyterian or, or anything. I describe myself as Orthodox. And yet, yet, I'm sure that some people might say, this guy isn't Orthodox <laughs> because he doesn't agree with me. So, now, in so... In so stating that, there are certain doctrinal issues that can't be negotiable. And those come up quickly. Those are the issues that come up quickly. The other issues are more in terms of sociology rather than theology that the theological debates are usually good debates, that the sociological debates have nothing to do with orthodoxy. I can call man, I can say anything I want to about man. I can say that he's no different than a pig. And I've said that. Uh, he's no different than a dog. And I've said that. Then I also caveat, I say, in an unsaved state. Now, some will argue that, that, for instance, some will argue that, well, the difference between the soul of man and the soul of animal is that the soul of man is immortal. But if you read some passages of Scripture, pretty soon you have an understanding that creation also. Why would creation look forward to its destruction? It isn't looking forward to its destruction. It's looking for, forward to our redemption and its redemption. And there's more verses of Scripture that point to that than anything. So, will we see dogs and cats in heaven? Probably. Now, does that, that might make me a heretic. But, you know, it's a great explanation to, uh, to a, for a 12-year-old who is mournful about her lost pet. And does it make anything different? No. Does it, does it matter? No. You see, and, and that's the point of, of inclusion versus exclusion. The point of the early church being inclusion or inclus inclusionary. Inclusionary? Is that a word? <laughs> anyway, and not exclusive. That it wasn't a, it was not a club of regality. That it was, that the church was to be united in love and in hope and in faith and not necessarily in doctrine and the proof of it is our church history because if we were to be united in doctrine then the church would be of one doctrine because the church reflects the will of God now if you debate that then that is theology 
And that's the point of orthodoxy versus heresy. F.F. <clears throat> F. Bruce writes, The man who says he believes that Jesus rose from the dead because the church says so, and the man who says he believes it because the New Testament says so, may not appear to see eye to eye on the final feet of authority in religion. It's a well, well said statement. F.F. F. Bruce, um, through all of his studies of, of historical church, through all of his exegetical works, through all of his Yea, a man may look the same doctrinally, but why is why is he believing what he believes? Is it because the church told him, or is it because the scripture told him? And that was the whole point of the Reformation. And this is what the whole point of the apologists are. That the apologists start in a new era uh, one that is that is no longer um, should I say no longer in reliance to the apostles and yet very much in reliance to the apostles in other words physically they are not there they are not taking the church under their wings as they had nor the bishops under their wings as they had. The bishops are now on their own. Paul had set forward the bishopric and, and he had commissioned and other apostles had commissioned bishops in, in every major metropolis. And that is what is referred to as apostolic succession. But the apologetic age, or the age in which emerges out of the, the death of John, becomes a very different setting for the church. First of all, it, it, is, it is the beginning of the first times when the Christian church is no longer viewed as a cult group or a sect of the Jews. And so Rome is viewing this quite a bit different than it had in the past. In the past, anything surrounding Christianity and the Jews, the persecutions and the, and the rioting that had taken place, was based on Jewish doctrine. And so it, it was no concern to Rome, except for they didn't like the riots. Because that, that spelled to the Roman Empire that something needed to be taken care of. And that that something was that the Pax Romana would provide every citizen peace within the Roman boundaries. In other words, they would be safe wherever they went within the Roman Empire. And that was, a, that was a, an establishment very early in the Roman Empire. So wherever Paul would go, he would be safe. He would be secure because he had the backings as a citizen of Rome, he had the backings of of a of a an army of a hundred and an army of a thousand and an army of ten thousand and an army of a hundred thousand and that's why the gospel spread so quickly 
That's why by, by the end of the apostolic times, we see that, that the gospel has gone to almost every portion, every nook and cranny of what was considered the Roman Empire, even to the outback, even to, even to those controlled by the military might of Rome, but not, you know, still demilitarized zones, so to speak. You know, it, it, there were still battles going on. There were certainly battles going on in Great Britain, and yet very early, Great Britain receives... It wasn't called Great Britain there. <laughs> but Great Britain receives, uh, <laughs> receives uh, the gospel. No. Yeah, there's there's a uh, there's a historian, a very fine historian on English uh, history, uh, and he uh, he says he says he's a, he's very much a purist on that. He says I will call the island what it is when it was. In other words, he just won't call. England, England, until it becomes England. He's not going to call Great Britain, Great Britain, until after James. And, and he just won't do that. And so it, many times when you're, when you're dealing in ancient uh, English history, and you, you, you're puzzled. Well, what's he referring to there? Where is it? And, and, but he's a purist. So, and, he's, and he's very, very uh, uh, dogmatic about that. So, so it, it, you, you have to have a map right next to you with his nomenclature. And when you identify his nomenclature, you have to write it down on that, on that part of the map so that you can follow. Otherwise, you're absolutely lost. Now, Pelican is kind of like that, too. When you read Pelican... Um, it's almost as though you need a companion. And the companion to Pelican would be some sort of timeline. The companion to Pelican would be some, uh, something that would give you more of an activity rather than a philosophical or a, or a doctrinal uh, increase or a doctrinal endeavor um, that that Pelican covers the issues, the theological and and uh, and sociological issues of the day, um, and he doesn't necessarily tell you. Well, this was the time when Nero uh, beat feet on the Christian community, or this was the time that Domitian. Uh, had his heyday. So he doesn't put that in into a, a rigid time. So that's why I, I, I really like F.F. Uh, F. Bruce's uh, The Spreading Flame. Uh, it's a very good companion. Un unfortunately, it's out of print. <laughs> but uh, but Pelican is, is uh, very good for understanding the issues that were going through the church at the time. The issues from without and the issues from within. The, the very essence that we label this time period as the apologetic age. Now, the apologetic age. Who were the apologists? Oh, here they are. Oh, boy. I must need new glasses. <laughs> Who are the apologists? Or what did they say? Roughly, and I'll just uh, make this easy, 100 to 313. And some people would extend that to Nicaea, which is 320... Five. I would I would ex I would say that it stops with uh, with Constantine uh, becoming emperor, so that uh, so that this is a new age uh, at the time of Constantine. Um, so which would be three thirteen. Um, but the apologists 
there were there were issues that were entering into the church from without. Um, should I say bombardments? And those were because this was the the time of when you first start to see Rome persecuting the church in general as a Christian group rather than a Jewish sect. That that you had those issues. You know, what did Rome think? What did Rome think about Christianity? One of the things that happens during that time is that the church may or may not be visible publicly. It may be an underground church. It may not be, depending on what's going on. And, and these persecutions, by the way, were basically regional. They, they, were, they, were, they were not long drawn out, except for a few of them. They weren't long drawn out uh, persecutions. It was, it was a, an edict passed down and a response from one of the governors who only held a, a time period of two years in office. So, in other words, it may or may not go on beyond the two years. So, a lot of these regional persecutions only lasted as long as the governor lasted in that, in that region. And they were, the basis was, what kind of attention did that governor want to get from Rome? You know what did the what did the what did the emperor say, and what did the governor do to carry out that edict? And everything, and this is very important, everything that Caesar said was edict. Everything. It became a part of Roman law. And because it was said by the pontiff or the pontificus maximus, and I want to use that term because it becomes very important at a later date, Because it was said by the Pontificus Maximus that it was also enduring. In other words, it could not be reversed by any predecessor. So it became immortal. It, Roman law was locked in immortality within the realm. And that becomes a very important part of later church history. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll discuss that also at that time. The apologists had to respond to this. They had to respond to what Rome and what Caesar thought of Christianity. So, many of their responses, and, and we'll, we'll talk about individual apologists and how they approached it, but many of the responses by the apologists were in regard to the reasonableness. I'm going to throw that one away. The reasonableness of faith. Now, mind you that when an apologist or when a bishop would write to Rome, he was going to get attention. As 
essentially he's saying, I am a Christian. And you may have said this, but I want to tell you that your best citizens are Christian. Now that becomes more intense later in this time. At 100, Rome didn't know what it had. And it wasn't concerned. Rome was not concerned about Christianity. In fact, the obtusity of Nero's persecution, even though it was, even though there was this understanding in Rome that, well, these are just sects of Jews. The obtusity of it created a, a downfall for Nero. That the Senate, and whether, who knows, whether it was just a political move or what, the Senate responded in disgust at what Nero was doing. And believe me, Nero was disgusting. So when the Senate responded that way, there were several charges brought against Nero. And, and this, by the way, was uh, about 68 and about the time of the death of Paul. When, when the charges were levied against Nero, they were on the basis of several things. One was that it was felt not proven, but felt that Nero had actually burnt Rome to blame it on the Christians so that he could persecute the group that led his wife away into Christianity. And essentially what he wanted to do was he wanted to be able to put away his wife. Kind of like Henry VIII. That's next quarter, by the way. <laughs> that charge brought about an e a a, a uh, position of the Senate for his execution. Before he was to be executed, he committed suicide. A week later, or excuse me, a week before, Paul had been executed. Now, had, had Paul not been executed, who knows whether he would have lived on or not. We don't know. Hey, he was an old man, too. I mean, we, we, we understand that he had a very incredible ministry. And, and the other part of the, of, <laughs> I guess uh, the other part of the picture is that, that one says, Oh Lord, teach me to number my days. And Paul certainly did that. And as you read Second Timothy, you get that indication, that, that very, uh, incredible understanding that Paul has that he is he has fought the good fight. He is being poured out as a drink offering. He says, and and so his understanding of his eminent uh, death uh, was coming. Now, how did Paul die? He was a Roman citizen. He was beheaded. He was uh, put to the sword. Uh, because he was a Roman citizen, he had the best of executions, or the clean, the clean execution. Uh, he wasn't taken out back and, and tortured as Christ was because he was not a Roman citizen. Nor would he be... Uh, placed on a cross. That was for non-citizens. Within the realm, within the realm of 
of the Roman Empire. Anybody who was a non-citizen was some degree of slave. Even though they might be landowners, they are still non-citizens and in some sort of degree of slavery or servitude to Rome. And the citizen had great, great, uh, it was a a great life for a citizen of Rome. It was a secure life. It was a, it was a life that, that one could do whatever they pleased. And they did whatever they pleased. So the apologists are responding to what Rome thinks of Christianity. And they're responding in in a way of faith is a reasonable understanding. Faith in Christ is reasonable. And they are also under they are also um, they are also presenting uh, the the attitude that your most devout citizens will be Christian. And not necessarily toward their God. What was what were what was Justin Martyr trying to accomplish? What was Origen trying to accomplish? What was Tertullian trying to accomplish? What they were trying to accomplish was to get Rome to recognize Christianity as a viable religion. And if Rome would recognize Christianity as a viable religion, then those who were Christians could live in peace if they so choose to live in peace. But because they were not a viable religion, should I say the bureaucracy was not in place. And Rome viewed Christians as this. They're depriving Rome of its support. Now, how so? Well, because they were not going to go once Christianity fell into its own enclave. It was not, should I say, mothered in by Judaism. And Judaism was the only exempt religion who could who would be able to serve one God. But all the others who for instance, if I was a Roman citizen, not a Jew, and I went to to if I went to Corinth I would have to serve Apollo because that was the temple in Corinth. And that was the way how I how did I serve Apollo? I'd go and I'd give my money. And I'd pay a temple tax. And that would go to Rome and I'd be on the books as having done my annual duty to a Roman god. Now the God of Judah was a Roman God then. The God of the Jews was a Roman God. And so once a year, all the Jews in the realm pilgrimed, pilgrimaged, pilgrimaged, <laughs> moved, <laughs> journeyed to Jerusalem. And they would fill the coffers and the temple in Jerusalem would send the temple tax to Caesar. And that's exactly what, what Jesus' reference was when, he, when, he, when the Jews said, Hey, tell me, is this, should we do this? Should we pay this tax to Caesar? And, and he said, Well, give me the coin. 
Oh, whose inscription is this? Oh, it's Caesar's. Well, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. That belongs to Caesar. And unto God the things that are God's. So Jesus was saying, yes, pay the temple tax. Pay the tax to Caesar. And that was, must have been an issue at the time. Just think, the Jews were probably at that time contemplating, you know, what if we don't send this? Well, I know what would have happened was the temple would have been destroyed a little earlier than 70 AD. But that wasn't the time that it was to be. Now, but, but at the same time, could I tell you that that, that made the temple... And that made all of these temples tax gatherers, didn't it? That's why Matthew was employed as a tax gatherer. Because he'd do the dirty work. But the other thing that, that the temple could do is they could do all kinds of currency stuff. Oh man, we got all kinds of currency here. Oh, so you didn't bring, you didn't bring a drachma? Oh darn... You didn't bring, you know, you didn't bring the proper coin in. So now you have to buy this coin. But, you know, there's a little markup price. We, we have a, a real deal for you today. Only Thursday, though. And so there were all of these, all of this economy around these centers. That's how Rome, that is how Rome got its wealth. Now, so Rome felt that the Christians deprived Rome of its support, its tax base. And that becomes an issue later on uh, 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 about the time of Pliny in Asia Minor. He says, gosh, nobody's going to the temple anymore because they're all Christians. They are not going to the temple and guess what? Times are bad. And I can only send this much. And what should I do with these quick Christians? Well, Caesar, and I believe that was uh, I'm not sure which uh, Caesar that was. I, I will have that for you later, but uh, I think it was. Um, I think it was um, I want to say uh, uh, Lucius Verus I'm, I'm not sure anyway um, Caesar responds to Pliny and says well don't seek out the Christians In other words, don't go from door to door and, and, and seek them out and, and take them and kill them. But if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I'm a Christian and I'm not paying taxes, then kill them. And that, so that was the edict. So it was all... To Rome, it was all an economic thing. So, so uh, apologists were trying to get this changed so that Rome wouldn't think. Because Rome didn't care about Christianity. And I want to emphasize that. Rome did not care about Christianity until a little later until a little later and, and, and that was a twofold thing there was, there was some later when, when some senators wanted to restore the public they wanted to also restore the ancient gods of Rome and so they were zealots for the old religion and, par, and, and their, their establishment of the republic would be based on that old religion and so anything, anything that, that uh, was not of the old religion was persecuted and, uh, and thought of as pagan to them.
<clears throat> the second concern of the apologist was the Jews. And the rabbinics, the rabbinic schools, were dialoguing with these apologists. And so many of the apologists responded. In, in fact, uh, Justin Martyr had a, a long dialogue with a, with a Jew named Trifo. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at a, a little bit of that uh, dialogue. But, but he, had, uh, he had many uh, uh, treatments of, of his dialogue with Trifo and, and uh, debating with the Jews about the Christ. And later, the intensity of that, and, and I had mentioned this earlier, later the intensity of that, those dialogues dissolved altogether. The Jews were not going to carry this on anymore, and, and that was about the same time that, that uh, Josephus was declared the traitor because, because the apologists in later ages were using your beloved Josephus even recognizes the special nature of Christ and the special work that, that the God of Israel that our God who is Christ Jesus has placed on the man James the just and so there were two Jews of repute who were favored by the rabbinics at the time. Well, what do we do? Now we, now we have to make a decision. Oh, they're both traitors. Now it was very easy, by the way, to, uh, to uh, link... Uh, James in with Josephus because of the things uh, the writing to, uh, of Josephus about James and, and you, you see that if James is a traitor then certainly or excuse me if, if Josephus is a traitor certainly James is too and prior to this he was uh, really understood as a kind of a martyr figure that he was understood as James the Just just as uh, if you read Josephus many of the rab rabbinics before that time of 6-700 when Josephus falls out of favor uh, refer to the ascetic life of, of James and, and how pleasing to God uh, James was and, and that he died a martyr's death. <clears throat> so the Jews uh, needed to be responded to. Now, uh, let me read a couple of things about uh, the Jew these Jewish debates. The rabbinic leaders stated that the Christian treated the Old Testament covenant with rash contempt, uh, spurning the responsibilities that come with the Mosaic Law. The, the counter of the apologists were, they said, that the Christians retained whatever in the law of Moses was naturally good, pious, and righteous. Now, this is, this is a, a very interesting statement because what now the apologists are presenting is a natural law. And that becomes uh, an issue at, toward the end of uh, the Reformation in regard to deism. And the, and the notion of reason over revelation. 
So we see the first controversy here developing about this question of reason versus revelation. That, that it's by reason in which I can understand a God. And it's by natural law which he reveals himself if there is such a thing as revelation, which there isn't. So, so this debate started back then. It, it started back in, in the time of the apologists, toward the end of the, of the time of the apologists, uh, in response to uh, this, this dialogue that, for instance, Justin Martyr had with uh, Tripo. <clears throat> so to the Christians... And, and this is, by and large, Gentile Christians. The church now is basically a Gentile church. After 110, there is no longer a Jewish bishop in Jerusalem because all of the Jews are extracted out of Judea that there's a buffer zone placed around Jerusalem and no Jew is to wander in. So, of course, that meant that the that Christian church is going to be, uh, the bishop will be a, a Gentile. And I believe at that time that was the last of the Jewish bishops. So, from 110 on, the, the church is, is Gentile. <clears throat> the third the third element. that the apologists were dealing with was heresy from within and as I said earlier I, I had mentioned that most of these conflicts within the church concerning theological matters come into play quite early and it's mostly surrounding the character of Christ or the form of Christ. So that the debate within the church is really who is Christ? Now the earliest apologists, they're actually called the they're actually called the apostolic fathers, and they aren't apostles. They're just the the immediate eyewitnesses, the disciples of the of, of the last apostles. And those are <clears throat> Barnabas which is, was Paul's companion. Uh, Clement of Rome, Hermas, Ignatius, Polycarp, and I'm going to add Papias in there. Barnabas, of course, uh, companion of Paul, uh, companion of John Mark, and uh, moves uh, uh, out with John Mark in the mission field, uh, establishing uh, churches uh, in the east and also in the south. John Mark ends up in, uh, in Alexandria. And John Mark is, and Barnabas are um, very much uh, attributed for the, 
for the church in Alexandria. Uh, also Carthage, uh, that uh, John Mark, I believe, ends up in Carthage and, uh, and uh, uh, takes the gospel with him there. <clears throat> Barnabas, Clement of Rome, Hermas, Ignatius, Polycarp, that's Ignatius of Antioch, by the way, and Papias. All of these men who are uh, considered apologists also the apostolic fathers if you look at the if you look uh, in the section of the library uh, for the Antonicene they are called the apostolic fathers and they they are they are the direct descendants of or direct disciples of the apostles <clears throat> all of these uh, men lived most of their lives before 150. Polycarp uh, dying around uh, 165, I believe, at a very, very old age. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch uh, uh, being martyred at 110 uh, during uh, Trajan's uh, uh, reign. <clears throat> Clement of Rome, uh, writing around 95. Hermas, uh, in Rome, he writes the shepherd of Hermas. Uh, he's mentioned by Paul in Romans 16:14. Uh, Ignatius uh, of Antioch writes seven epistles en route to his uh, martyrdom, um, all to various churches in Asia Minor. Papias, uh, Bishop of Hierapolis, writes the epistle to Diogenetus, and what that was was a collection of the Lord's sayings. He collected them and, and, and made some comment on them. Now, not many of these documents, not many of these epistles are incomplete. We don't have all of the completed texts. We have a lot of, of them. But uh, most of those were restored uh, by Eusebius. And so, not only did Eusebius uh, in about 320... 325, not only did Eusebius write his history, but he also brought together many of these writings. And that was part of his, remember, that was part of his commission by Constantine. That he was commissioned by Constantine to, to put together church uh, scriptures. And so he was gathering all of these, uh, these materials. In fact, uh, Constantine uh, put uh, Eusebius in, uh, in uh, charge of creating a library in, in Constantinople. It would be a Christian library. And so... Uh, Constantine did several things. One, that would not just be writings, but it would also be sacred relics. That was kind of the uh, initial point of, uh, of you know, bringing the apostles' bones uh, into one location to preserve them in various other parts of the cross and, and all kinds of... Uh, Holy relics that was considered are those that things that were considered holy relics. Now, <clears throat> there were other writings that are at this time that that are really unknown. 
um, that are uh, that the writers themselves are unknown, and that is that is um, we have, uh, for instance, the Didache. And, and after the break, we're, we're going to be taking a break here shortly. The, the Didache, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the Didache. So let's, uh, let's stop there and have a, have a short break. <laughs>